Welcome to the Green Building Show, where we investigate green design and building trends throughout Australia. As the recent devastation in Queensland has sadly demonstrated, building a cyclone-proof home or a cyclone-resistant home is an important factor for many Australians. This week, we continue our disaster design series. I sit down with Pahia from SPAD Consulting Engineers, who's going to explain the fundamentals of good cyclone design. In Australian style, we take another look at a remote wonder. Light Home Design Ambassador Clinton Cole is going to bring us a standout piece of architecture in an isolated island setting. In this week's What's Hot, Mark Jones will bring us the latest Light Home Hot Design blog, and in You Asked Us, we'll be hearing from James Hardy's Reese Labo. I'm here with Bahia, he's the director of SPAD Consulting Engineers based in Sydney. Thanks for being with us, Bahia. Oh, thanks, it's a pleasure for me. We're doing a series on disaster design and we're talking about building for extreme circumstances and in this case we're talking about cyclones and high wind areas. Sure. Can you tell us what, what is the, the main challenges for building in a cyclone prone area? The cyclone prone area straight away throws in the main, one of the main problems is that it has got very high wind pressures during cyclonic areas. Very high wind speed, as a result you have very high wind pressure on the wall, on the walls and the superstructure of the building. Then the stability of the building is at stake. It can be, uh, it can have uplift problem, and then lateral load problems. So the stability is in question. So we had to stabilize the house or the building to resist the wind, uh, wind loads, high wind loads caused by cyclone. And what about air pressure? What kind of challenges does that present? Or what so kind of pitfalls or, or problems does that present to so a? Normally, uh, most of the problem is uh, on the walls, on the superstructure, on the walls. You have on one, one side you've got a very strong positive pressure, it'll, it'll going to push the house down. Yeah, on the sa at the same time, there's the other side of the wall which is going to suck the um, wall out. Then there's the, on the roof, usually it's always suck, sucking the roof out. So that's why you see the um, roof, roof sheeting flying away. And then it made worse, it's made worse when you have, well, in case one of the windows or doors get open or broken in or, or breaks due to wind, then the uh, pressure gets into that, positive pressure comes in into the house. So suction outside, positive pressure inside, and it simply blows, up, blows the house up. So that's the um, uh, problem with houses. And talking about lightweight construction in particular, how would someone go about creating a house or building a house of lightweight materials in it and to prevent it from, from that circumstance that you just mentioned. Right, okay, yeah. Say, uh, say we'll go from stage by stage. Say, l let's look at the house as two basic elements. One is the flat, uh, the slab, floor slab or the flooring. So it has to have a slab? Uh, not necessarily, but let's say there's a flooring underneath or you need to have proper in, in uh, well embedded stills or the posts or piles in, in, into the uh, ground. So these are two different type of construction. So let's look at one by one. So let's say one has a slab, floor slab, and a cover over that, that makes the house. Then what you need to do is, the slab is fairly solid, so what you need to do is put the cover, the walling and the, and the roof, make sure you, you tie it down and then fix it to the floor slab so it doesn't fly away, fall down. And on the other type of one, what you do is you have, you do not have a concrete slab but everything is timber but then you have got large strong posts dug into the ground so it's solid stable it doesn't get flown away it doesn't get fall uh, it doesn't fall down so it's again stable so okay. you can either way you can stabilize the house okay but houses say they're built around the sydney area which isn't known for its cyclones obviously if they're built on a slab they're still going to be um, bolted or secured to the slab no any building that's built irrespective of where it is it has to be pretty much tied down to the ground so does that mean that that, that houses in a, a cyclone prone area should be bolted um, with more uh, more touch points exactly that's that's ex exactly that's the case in fact the the standards australia has a publication say a 1684 cyclonic area and non-cyclonic area the main difference is the cyclonic area has much more 
heavier stiff, stiffer, stiffer fixing down, tying down, and as well as bracing horizontally. There's a, there are two things. One is lifting and uh, flying away. Other one is sort of falling down like a pack of cards. So that's two different types of um failure modes. One is uh, flying away. That is sort of a due to suction is uplift force. Other one is falling like a pack of cards. So both has to be resisted. And what about framing? Do you think it's better to have a timber frame which can have, have a little bit of flex to it or a steel frame which is probably more in, has more uh, structural integrity? Well, I think uh, it's this way. Either way you can get it to work. Timber can work well, steel can work well. Normally for typically for a domestic building the timber would be adequate so they are not very high, very tall. But when you go a bit taller then steel might be a bit more easier to design. Not that you cannot do with timber, but it could be more cost effective with the larger buildings to do with steel. So you know, basically you rely on the flexibility of the building and then it can be tied down boards. Yep, okay, great. And say there was two houses, one was built in Sydney where there's no cyclones and one was built in northern Queensland where they're relatively frequent. Yeah. If they were on the outside or from an you know, aesthetic point of view, they're exactly the same house. In, this, in the structural design, what do you think would be different between the two? Oh, the member sizes will be a lot different. Timber sections will be heavier, and then tie-down will be more stiffer, the larger, much heavier. Tie-down will be there. Bracing requirements will be much heavier. That is internal cross walls where it sort of a, uh, butts the walls. They will be heavier. And what about um, glazing or you know, glass yeah, glaze, is, that, is there going to be any difference? Absolutely, the? yeah. We are glazing again, this has to be designed for a heavier wind. So it will be thicker or maybe it might have more supports. It will have a heavier wind beam over the glazing. In case if they fail, totally it will sort of a blow up the house. It, it goes in and then pressure builds up. That's disaster. So a lot of care should be taken with regard to the doors and windows as well. And, and for someone uh, who wants to build a house in, in, in a cycling prone area, who can they call to give them help? Do they have to, will they have to get an engineer in or they have, could they build, will their builder have the qualifications to do it? Can they just read a couple of the manuals released by the government? Where can they get information of um, how yes, to build? Certainly I will not advise them to read, a, read the manual and go and build a house. Uh, I think the best way would be to engage an engineer, structural engineer, to do that. I mean, that would be the best way. I, I, I believe that even if you go to the builder, he would say the same thing. But uh, by the same token, there are enough guidelines given in Standard Australia 1684, which uh, pretty much prescribes the details and of a house construction for cyclonic area. I think I'll have to uh, give you another point about the cyclonic areas, that's about the roof fixings uh, in the cyclonic area. Yep. Typically what we do here is um, we have the metal screws or, or, the, uh, or some sort of anchors to fix the roofing. But in cyclonic areas when you have cyclic loading, it, it has got uh, long term uh, fatigue loading on the screws and then they snap and fail. What's the solution? The uh, solution could be, uh, one of the things is uh, the shape of the building can be changed. So even now I see in Queensland you have this flat, beautiful roof with uh, like a sail. It's pretty much like a sail. You, know, you take the house and go for a sail. If you have such building, naturally the loads will be higher and then the loading on the screws will be higher Then you tend to lose the roof easier. So one is provided you can uh, manage, you can have a typical standard roof construction, the tile roof with 30 degree slope instead of a flat roof. Flat roof always causes more problems of wind. So a typical 25 or 30 degree slope tile roof, that'll be even better. Hi Mark, what's this week's hot design blog? Uh, this week we found a website called The State of Green. It's a shopping website that's uh, blossomed into a blog about everything green uh, from design, uh, recycled materials, etc. There was even a recycled wedding dress from uh, bread tags that we found. State of Green was set up by Jenny Tranter. Um, she's the, the founder and uh, regular uh, main contributor. She has a small team of contributors that help out and her main aim is to uh, 
help you continue to live in a modern society while having a lighter footprint on the planet. Um, you can follow all of her um, tweets and uh, design tips at uh, State of Green One. Um, and just as a word of warning, this blog is seriously addictive, so check it out. All right, we'll just start with a basic question. I guess, why did you choose this house for your ambassador's choice? I think it really typifies uh, what, what lightweight construction is all about. The, um, the location itself um, had limitations in terms of access to deliver materials. The, um, all materials had to be brought in by barge, uh, and that, I guess, by default, um, lent itself uh, to light, a lightweight system. Um, including um, when the barge arrives at Dangar Island, where the, where the property is located, you have, you have to take the material by hand up to the site. Um, so it all had to be um, uh, just pretty lightweight for the labourers to move it around. Okay, great. And I mean, the architect says this is a. It's it's from from what I've read on her website. It, it's a new take on prefab. Can you explain, yes. you know, what her steel prefab system is exactly and how it works? Sue Harper uh, and her husband, Andy Irvine, who developed the system, uh, this was um, uh, this was their, their first prototype, if you like, uh, and they've refined it on a number of projects since. Um, but what they're trying to <coughs> what they're trying to develop is uh, a system that can be built um, quickly uh, and that can uh, be modified over time based on uh, based on budget. So the uh, so the Dengar Island uh, home uh, has uh, aluminium doors and windows throughout. Uh, they can be <coughs> lifted out. <coughs> Excuse me, Carl. Yeah. Uh, they can be lifted out and uh, replaced with uh, timber doors and windows. Um, you don't have to have doors and windows at all. You can just have uh, hinge panels within the frame, uh, and the uh, and that's kind of the beauty of the system is that it um, it the structure and the framing in itself does all the work. So uh, it does all the work, and, and everything else is just an infill. So you can modify it, improve it over time, or in fact disassemble it and reassemble it as has occurred on their own studio a number of times. Fantastic. All right, and, and you touched on it before, Clint, maybe just go into a little bit more detail. I um, guess what, what, were, what were the real challenges of building um, on an island and, and you know, what, what were the owners trying to achieve with this house? Well, they had, they had a really tight budget for their client um, and they, they dealt with the budget by... Um, by reducing the time on site, so they knew from the outset to um, to uh, get a pro to get a, to get a decent outcome that the building had to be uh, erected very quickly. Um, so, in, in addition to the limitations of access, um, they still uh, it, they wanted a, a um, whilst it's great to get the materials there, get them to site. You want to make sure that the system goes together really quickly, so the labour costs are, are, are minimised. Today we have a question from Jeffrey, and he's asked, what is the best 2.4 by 1.2 sheet cladding that would deliver good insulation properties for exterior use in a Tasmanian climate? Well, to help me answer this, I've, I've, I've got on the line Reese Labo. He's a technical support officer with James Hardy. Thanks for being with us, Reese. Hi, uh, pleasure. Great. So you, can you give us a, what's, what's your stab at this question? Okay, yeah, uh, so yeah, we have a few, few products fitting the 2.4 by 1.2 meter sheet sizes. Um, these include the Easy Lab, Hardy Flex, Panoclad, and Scar and Axon range. Um, the thermal performance of a wall is measured in terms of what is called an R value. Uh, according to the DCA, Tasmania is located in a climate 7 zone, which outlines a minimum R value of 2.8 to be achieved. Uh, through the use of bulk insulation and reflective sarking, any of the mentioned claddings can achieve the minimum R value. Uh, for example, to achieve an R value of 2.8, uh, you can simply use a, an R 2.7 high density wall bat installed in a, a 90 mil deep wall frame. Uh, another option is to use a 2.5 bat in a 90 mil deep wall frame and put our cladding on treated timber battens and use uh, a breathable reflective sarking behind the battens to achieve the minimum R value of 2.8. Um, for, for more information, um, always refer to uh, jameshardy.com.au. Reese, thank you for that. And Jeffrey, I hope yeah. that, hopefully that um, answers your question.